So here's a weird thing I've noticed. Look, this vehicle has its rear lights on and they look normal, but I'm also filming it on my GH5. And just watch for a second and see what happens. There you go, look, they turn off and they come back on again. What's that? And here are the front lights. What's going on there? Crazy. I reckon I can explain what's happening here, but first I want to say why it's important. You might think it doesn't matter that there's a strange interaction between my camera and the lights on the back of a car. So long as it looks the way it's supposed to look to human eyes, then that's all that matters because ultimately it's a human driver that's going to be making decisions about safety based on the cars around them. Except that, well, personally, I hope that in the not too distant future, I won't have to be the human making those decisions. I want a computer to be making those decisions for me. In other words, I want my self-driving car. So while LED lights on cars might look normal to our analog human senses, a self-driving car builds up a model of the world based on digital senses. So the way it perceives LED lights on cars might be closer to the footage that I captured on my digital camera. So let's see if we can concoct a scenario in which that kind of digital artifact might be a problem. Here in the UK, the rear lights of a car are red and the turn signals or indicators as we call them here are amber. But in America, turn signals can be red. So an artificial intelligence may receive this video footage and conclude the vehicle intends to turn or if it can see both lights that the vehicle is indicating a hazard. And based on that information, it could make a dangerous decision. I'm not saying that the turn signal system in the UK is better than the system in America. I'm just heavily implying it. This isn't the only hazardous scenario we can imagine. To cook up a few more, we need to understand why it's happening in the first place. And it's all to do with the way we vary the brightness of LEDs. So you could vary the voltage, and that would vary the brightness. But actually, it's easier and cheaper to instead simply turn the LED off and then turn it back on again and just do that repeatedly. But you do it so fast that it's not perceptible to the human eye. So, for example, if it's turning on and off 50 times a second, that won't be noticeable to most people most of the time. Let's look at this on a timeline. So if the LED is turning on and off 50 times per second, then look, each block here represents a 50th of a second and the LED is on for half the time in each one of those blocks. So in this scenario, the LED would appear to be half as bright as if it was on continuously. And if you wanted to make it appear dimmer than that, then you would just have it on for a shorter fraction of that 50th of a second. And if you wanted it to be brighter, then you would have it on for a larger fraction of that 50th of a second. The fraction of time for which the LED is on is called the duty cycle. And this method of dimming LEDs is called pulse width modulation. Now let's add a camera to the timeline. Here the camera is operating at 50 frames per second and we're showing that the shutter is only open for a small fraction of that 50th of a second. So what the camera is seeing while the shutter is open is that the LED is on and it's on for the whole duration that the shutter is open. So when you look back at the footage, you'll see that the LED appears to be on, which is good because that's what the human perceives as well, except we've already introduced a digital artifact because from the point of view of the camera, the LED appears to be on 100% of the time. So it will appear brighter to the camera than it would to a human. But even worse, imagine we started the camera a little bit later. So we're shifting everything along a little bit. Now the shutter is open when the LED is off and it will be for every single frame. So when you look back at the footage, the LED appears to be off. And now look, we already have another disastrous scenario where the lights don't appear to be on at all. For example, watching this footage, you might assume that the BMW driver has neglected to use the turn signal, but a BMW driver would never do that. So it must be an issue with the camera. It can also cause problems with LED traffic lights. Imagine that, a red light telling you to stop that the camera just can't see. The timeline that we've been using up to now shows an LED and a camera with the same frequency, 50 hertz. 
But in reality, that might not happen particularly often. For example, maybe the frequency of the LED is gonna be slightly less than the frame rate of the camera. So let's stretch out the LED line to illustrate that. And now you can see, look, sometimes the open shutter of the camera lines up with the LED when it's on, and sometimes it lines up with the LED when it's off. So when you watch the footage back, what you perceive is an LED that seems to be turning on and off repeatedly, which is exactly what I got with the Mercedes here. This slow apparent turning on and off of the LEDs is called the beep frequency. Practically speaking, you could probably quite easily teach an artificial intelligence to recognize that this footage from the Mercedes isn't a turn signal because the light is on for far too long and it's only off for a brief period. It doesn't look like a turn signal, but the point is, there's no standardization in the LEDs in cars, which is to say the duty cycle could be anything, the frequency could be anything, and it's trivial to concoct a beep frequency that looks just like a turn signal. In fact, this footage was captured in the wild, and I think this would even fool a human observer, which actually reminds me, this isn't just a problem for self-driving cars and AI. Some car manufacturers are starting to replace wing mirrors with cameras. So you look at the central screen in your car instead of at your wing mirrors. And yeah, it would be easy to think that a car was turning in this scenario. There are a few more scenarios, but I'll tell you about one more, which is when the frequency and the frame rate are quite different, you end up with this horrible, really fast flicker. And at the corner of your eye, a human could interpret that as an emergency vehicle nearby. These might seem like edge case bugs in the system, and they are, they're only gonna crop up very rarely. But it's not like an edge case bug in a mobile phone, for example, where if it's really expensive to fix the bug, you could just ignore it because it's only affecting a handful of people, and they'll probably just jump ship to Android. If the edge case bug exists in a self-driving car, then it could kill or injure that handful of people. So you have to find a fix. It would be nice if we could just control the environment, like force all car manufacturers to revert back to incandescent bulbs. But incandescent bulbs are bad for other reasons, like they're hugely energy inefficient and you can't use them to create these really interesting designs that we see in car lighting these days. But also it's just not how the world works, is it? And actually that's a general problem that autonomous vehicles face, which is, the world is messy and you're gonna to have to deal with that. If we can't change the world around the car, we have to change the car. But what does that solution look like? I spoke to someone who knows a lot more about these things than I do. Uh, yeah, so my name is Robert Stead. We organize conferences for nerds who work on automotive safety systems to do with cameras and other uh, perception sensors. So, so what do you do? Do you train the AI on all these different LED flicker scenarios? or do you fix the camera? Yeah, so so the latter really. Rather than saying, okay, we accept that there's a flashing light here and we need to train the system differently, there's mitigation that you can put in place at the sensor level so that what, what the camera does eventually see is a solid brake light when it's meant to see a solid brake light. One solution would be to make sure that the shutter of the camera is open for the entirety of the frame. That way, if the frequency of the LEDs is at least I don't double the frame rate of the camera, then the camera should be capturing roughly the right brightness in each frame. I can illustrate that quite nicely with my camera. See here, the shutter is only open for a brief fraction of the frame. I'm getting quite bad flicker from the front headlights. But as I increase the amount of time that the shutter is open for, that starts to fade away. You can see the problem now is that the image is overexposed because we're letting too much light onto the sensor. To counteract that, we can close down the aperture, reducing the amount of light hitting the sensor. There's still a little bit of rolling shutter artifact, but it's nowhere near as bad. So is that the solution? Keep the shutter open for the whole frame and make the aperture smaller? Uh, well, yes and no. We do want to keep the shutter open for the whole frame, but we can't change the size of the aperture. I spoke to some engineers working on the problem, and they tell me that the cameras on cars are fixed aperture. That's because the variable aperture mechanism in a lens is quite delicate. And if you think about what a car goes through, imagine the camera that's attached to the boot of a car and repeatedly slamming that boot closed. 
that delicate mechanism isn't going to survive. So instead, they're working on camera sensors that have the capability of being much less sensitive, or to put it in normal camera terms, to create a camera that has the possibility of a much lower ISO. That way, you could keep the shutter open for the whole frame without it being overexposed. You might be thinking that if you keep the shutter open for the entirety of a frame, you're going to occasionally have really bad motion blur to deal with. And that's true, but it seems as though it's easier for artificial intelligence to deal with motion blur than it is for these flickering LED artifacts. So when's it going to be fixed? Well, that's an interesting question, but at the same time, there are loads and loads of problems that need to be fixed before we see the mass adoption of self-driving cars. And they're all being solved in parallel. So it's really hard to say. So it's one of those situations where, you know, it's quite easy to develop the first 98% of the technology and make it 98% safe. But in order for us to deploy vehicles, fully driverless vehicles on the road, mixed in with other traffic, you know, they have to be super, super safe. You know, uh, I often talk about speculative technologies and it throws up a certain type of person that you meet in the comments that, that says, well, uh, this is why it's not going to work. The end. And I can understand why it's fun to leave a comment like that because it, it feels good. It's like, I've thought of this thing that makes it all impossible. None of you thought of it. You're all idiots and I'm really clever. Um, so I'm going to type it. What I really like is you have this other type of person who says, yeah, we knew about that problem and we built it anyway because that's how you figure out how to solve the problem. These, these are just, they're all technical challenges. And when you break it down, they're all, they're all quite niche technical challenges that all come together to create the whole system. Um, yeah, and there's, there, there's plenty of nerds out there that like to, like to work on solving those problems. Thanks to the IEEE P2020 Standards Group for helping with this video and for letting me use their footage. And thanks to Merck for sponsoring this video. Merck is a science and technology company. As part of their Curiosity Initiative, they want us all to be more curious in our everyday lives. Like, for example, on your commute, maybe you start thinking about how the lights on modern cars work and how they might interact with autonomous vehicles in the future. Can't just be me. On their Worlds of Curiosity website, they talk about why curiosity is so important and how it could lead to a better world. Link to that in the description. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and I'll see you next time.